Welcome to the Business in Colour podcast with Devon Sartner. We are women of colour, our passion is diversity, and we thrive on conversations that lead to action. So we decided to bring you these discussions with culturally diverse leaders and allies who share stories of their journey to a more diverse workplace. They speak from the heart. They are leaders who are committed to making a difference. We know that these stories will inspire you to lead your own conversations and spark action on diversity in your business and in your life. If you enjoy listening to the Business in Colour podcast, please leave us a review and share with your tribe. Thank you for tuning into Business in Colour. Our conversation today is with a wonderful human, Emma Isaacs. Emma is the global CEO for Business Chicks and is currently residing in LA. I have known Emma for many years and we have had many, many conversations about diversity and how we can do more to move the dial forward. In this podcast, we talk about the impact of living in LA, the elections and Black Lives Matter has had on her, the family and business chicks. She shares with us the racial conversations, the protests and the overall grief that has been felt. Emma talks about the changes she has made to business chicks, like appointing a diversity board, and what the future of the business looks like. I got goosebumps when Emma talked about how as leaders, we are all learning a new language, how we can be better allies and own our own mistakes. And like us, Emma was holding her breath on the results of the elections And I think collectively we have all had a sigh of relief and hope that any transition that happens, happens smoothly. This is a raw, open, honest conversation with an incredible leader who is determined to reframe the conversation on diversity and take definitive action. Please enjoy our podcast conversation with the fabulous Emma Isaacs. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Business in Colour with Sadna and Div. Before we start, we would all like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects to leaders past, present and emerging. Now, Div, I have been so excited about this podcast because we are talking to one of the most amazing women that I know in my life, the wonderful, fabulous, amazing Emma Isaacs, all the way from L.A. You're in L.A., aren't you? Yeah, I'm LA, LA baby. LA baby. Welcome, Emma. (laughs) Hi, you two. It's great to be here. I'm so excited for our chat. Now, first thing I want to do is talk about your book. I'm trying to do it in such a way. Winging it. Right, here we go. You can see it now. You've just launched this in the US. Um, yeah, this, is, this is my version. I, there you yeah, go. Nice. Perfect. 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 <laughs> now, um, I read this in Fiji by the pool when you <laughs> when you first when released it here in Australia. Well, it's about a couple of years old now, isn't it, for Australian mm-hmm. audiences? How's how's the launch going in the US? Uh, let me tell you, this is very very different launching a book in America as it is to Australia, but. It's resonating. It's being received really, really well. The quick, really quick backstory to it is, like you said, Sardner, I released it in Australia. I think it was July 2018. So yeah, a good, a good two years ago now. And, you know, I mean, obviously it was pre, 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 pre COVID. So we were allowed on planes and yes. buses and cars and boats. Um, so I got to travel around and talk to people about my story and the book. And that was amazing. So very, very different world now trying to do a book tour from the comfort of my own home with a hundred children running around, um, you know, trying to make sure they're not barging in, but listen, it's great. We published, we've got a publisher out of America. Obviously we sold the rights here. I had to do a bit of a rewrite just to, you know, make sure the stories were uh, suitable to a North American audience, but to change the spelling, um, mm. you know, mum became mom and organisation, you know, we lost the S and put a Z in and all that sort of stuff. But um, it's great. It's great. And Americans, I'm sure we're going to talk about it more in our chat today, but it's um, they, they, they have a cultural comfort with supporting one another. They, they have more of a comfort I think than we do in Australia, you know, it's, it's, they tend to open up their little black book and, you know, say, here, I, I need you to meet this person. And so there's been a lot of generosity around um, mm. the reception of the book. So it's going really well. It's sold out in its first week, which is both a, an amazing problem and a really awful problem because all the printers <laughs> were backed up with COVID and 
uh, Obama's memoir, which they're printing 3 million copies. So all these printers, you know, are really strong. But yeah, it's going great. And I'm very, very grateful. It hit number one in one of the business categories. So I can officially oh. say that I'm a number one Amazon bestseller, which oh, is my yeah. Congratulations. Um, well done. You, yeah. Very, so very well deserved. You. Thank you. Now, as the global CEO for Business Chicks, you made the decision a few years ago to move to the States. And do you know what? Every time I hear news on the on the US elections or Black Lives Matters, and we'll talk about all of that, I always think of you. Tell me what what it is it what is it like living there with so much happening? So you know, you've got the elections, you've got riots, you've got Kamala Harris, you've got Black Lives Matter. I want to delve into all of that, but talk to us about what's it like living there at the moment? Yeah, so we moved to the States five years ago now. We all, we, we've always been in LA that entire time. We chose Los Angeles as a base because it's the proximity to Australia. It's a good one direct flight. You know, we landed here, I suppose, you know, one of the first things I noticed at our local elementary school was the diversity of, you know, the class makeup was phenomenal. So we're in a very, very diverse neighbourhood. I'd to put numbers on it, probably about a 30% um, Korean population. Um, I don't know, like a 15% Hispanic population, 15% um, black and the rest, you know, a mix. So I love that. I love my kids got dropped into a, a really great diverse um, neighborhood and school. So that was really phenomenal. Um, when you ask the question on what's it like here, I mean, it's like anywhere, right? I mean, I, I'm really, really, what's the word? I'm, I really try and put up some boundaries and barriers for what sort of content reaches me because I think that if I like, like anywhere in the world this doesn't it's not immune to America but um you know really try and not read every single piece of news every single day and I really try and yeah just put up boundaries and make sure that the content I'm consuming is is productive right so and also I'm, I'm an introvert so I, I love my home I'm a cancerian if you believe anything about star signs so I love being home and we also have a big 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 family so I sort of get my social needs met from this little village that we've created inside our home I'm telling you that because you know I I I am, I go quite, you know, not withdrawn, but I'm an internal person. So the other thing is we're not getting any, you know, we're all doing virtual schooling. So none of my kids are at school. So we're not having the sort of school gate conversations as well. But the broader feeling here in the US, everyone is completely holding their breath um, until November 3. You know, there are good days and bad days. Sometimes we think, oh my gosh, this might be happening. And then another poll comes out and you think, no, it's really not happening. And also I would say that the state of California and likewise the state of New York is very pro Biden Harris. And like every, I mean, every sign on this street, there's every front yard has a Biden Harris sign on it. Um, so again, we're a little bit cocooned, but you know, my, my husband took the kids on a trip to Arizona last week and you know, those Trump flags were a flying. So it's scary in terms of the racial conversation and, and you know, what happened in the days and weeks um, after George Floyd's murder, the, the protests were pretty wild here in LA. We live um, very, very close to the mayor of Los Angeles. So we had protests going down the street of, you know, I mean, thou I don't know the number, but thousands and thousands of people. Um, they were very gentle. They were very, I mean, they're completely non-violent. There, there were riots and there was looting of stores, probably about five minutes away from us. But what happened on our on our doorstep was very, very calm and gentle, and certainly passionate. But you know, there was no violence, and mm. it was it was actually really um, it was actually really moving to watch more than anything. It was really, you know, I I, I saw this quote from a religious leader, and and I'm gonna, I'm paraphrasing, and it's not right, but it said something like. You know, while you were looking for the looters and the rioters and the violence, you know, you missed seeing the a grieving community. And, you know, I encourage you to look harder and look harder and, you know, look with compassion at, at the grief that was just being outpoured. And that's certainly what, you know, I experienced. I mean, it's it's confronting having thousands of people, um, you know, imagine and on your doorstep right now, yeah. thousands of people walk past. And obviously yeah. with COVID, we were, everyone was masked and, and it was it was definitely a sight. But you know, I, we went out onto the front pavement or we say sidewalk here. <laughs> and, you know, I stood there with um, our kids and we just clapped all the protesters. And mm. that's, you know, that was sort of our, I mean, I was a hundred weeks pregnant at that yes. point. Otherwise I would have been walking, walking with them. 
but yeah, that was, it was, it was just very, very somber moment. We, the city of Los Angeles um, sent us into curfew. So we weren't allowed out, outside our homes. I think the hours were like 8 PM to 5 AM. So everyone was inside and, you know, I mean, LAPD has a huge presence here and they do a lot of their, their work via helicopter. So it was loud. I mean, there were helicopters overhead that whole time. And, you know, it was, it was a really, really scary um, and dark moment for an, anyone who lived in this city and, and not, just, not just LA. I mean, it was happening all around um, in protests all around the United States. And really it, it was just a, you know, collective response to a huge amount of violence and a huge amount of grief and a huge amount of outpouring and a huge response to a massive, um, I, I suppose, p- push down of, Ongo, you know, trauma that had been there for, for so long. And, you know, finally there was a communal reaction to that trauma and a community reaction to the violence. And it's just, it's just appalling and shocking to me. And, and since his death, there have been 357 other murders by police, you know. And so that really sent me, you know, we all knew this stuff, right? We, we all knew it. Not, certainly not to the extent and certainly not to, to to the level at which, like, you know, I started following all these different um, accounts on social media as we all did. You know, I, I watched a, a number of white people commit crimes. Like there was one man who was running around naked. I don't know if you saw this clip, but he was running around naked. He just um, killed, I want to say, like two, two, two people. It was either two or three people, right? The police knew he had done it. He was running around naked. He'd obviously caused a huge amount of you know, concern in in wherever he was. And, you know, the police are not shooting him and the police are not like they're they're chasing him, Mm. but they're not bashing him. They don't have a knee on his neck, you know, so that kind of, you know, and I saw 35 examples of that, right. Just the brutality um, and violence against people of color, you know, and just to have that all brought in, into our, um, you know, on our, on our screens and and to really have that highlighted as um, a moment in time was just such a, still remains like you know we we've we've seen Brianna Taylor and there's been no justice yes. there and it's it's not as if it's it's gone away because not everyone's talking about George Floyd every single day but it really rattled me so obviously it rattled everybody well hopefully it rattled you know most people but um you know I was I think I was 39 weeks pregnant um when George Floyd lost his life and you know, I remember I birthed my I knew I was expecting a son we'd found out that um we we're going to have a little boy and I just couldn't stop thinking about, you know, the fact that my little guy was going to be born and would never know the idea of having to think about, you know, or his mom having to think about what would happen when he left the front door every single day. And, you know, we hear stories, even, you know, Michelle Obama's mom used to say to her brother, like, please be a little less black today. Like when you leave, be a little less mm-hmm. black. So, you know, I just that was juxtaposed with me having a son and George Floyd losing his life. And it just, um, it, it, it really, it really, really shook me up for many, many, many weeks there. And, and I, and I mean, it still does to this day, but I just remember back to those days, it was really, um, I don't know. It was just, it was a lot, it was a lot for everyone. Um, and, you know, I, I tried to, I remember like some of our mutual friends, Sadna, like, you know, Kemi. Yes you know, reaching out to her and and we had some beautiful back and forth and reading the advice was to check in on our black and brown friends. And, you know, that, that was a really weird thing as well, right? Because I I did that, but we have so many um, beautiful black and brown friends here that I've never had racial conversations with, right? I just assumed we didn't really need to have those conversations. Mm. You know, their their kids play with my kids. They're over in our pool all the time that my kids are going to their house for play dates. So I never really, you know, I mean, we, we have small talk and we have friendships, but I'd never really, we'd never really discussed race, right? So I was reaching out to these people and saying, you know, how I, like, awkwardly, you know, how are you and how are you doing? And they'd write back, good, babe, how are you? Like, when are we getting together? Like, how's the baby? And I'd be like, that didn't work. That didn't, that didn't go the way I, I, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to have a conversation about this. So yeah, that, that it's, it's obviously been a lot for, for everyone. And then, I mean, it's my lived experience is completely different to, you know, my friends who are black or brown, but, you know, I, I have, it has been beautiful since opening those conversations up. And when I've had the time to, to get past small talk and sit with my friends and, and I have, yeah, 
had a lot of really um, incredible conversations and hopefully some actions from those conversations with a lot of our friends over here. But yeah, we're, 2020 is a heavy year. Let it me is. tell you, it's a heavy year. And then, you know, I just we just need something to happen to go our way November 3 because I'm, I'm not sure the planet can really take another four mm. years of this. It's just a lot. So, yeah, I'm sorry to go. No, no, that's good. That's it's good. I, you yeah. know, what's what's beautiful to see is your vulnerability and the personal journey that you've walked with it because I think that's been many people's journey, to be honest. Like I've had people reach out to me and ask me about how I was doing in the Black Lives Matters, uh, when the Black Lives Matters movement hit Australia. And it was very interesting because I remember having a conversation with Sadna saying this, talk of does it matter to us because we are, we're kind of brown and we're not black so can we own this conversation and when Sadna and I talked about it I mean we really we, we each have our own story with regards to our race and our culture and our ethnicity and to varying degrees of inequity to be honest because living as a a black African American in 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 the U.S. is completely different from here, but um, we all have our own stories of inequity. And um, brown or black, it is there. Mm. Uh, so I think we all resonated with the Black Lives Matters movement as as you did, and it's wonderful to hear your personal journey. Mm. Can I ask you for a moment to switch on your business hat for business chicks yeah. um, and tell us what was the journey that you walked as a leader? Mm. through this response of the Black Lives Matters movement and being there in that moment, you know, what decisions did you make? Did you want to make a public statement as a leader? How did that work internally in your team? Mm. Because I'm, I'm sure that you had this very strong reaction and em empathy, mm. but maybe potentially others in your organization didn't have a strong reaction. I mean, how did you navigate making those decisions to make a statement or not. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, they're all great questions. And we made so many mistakes and we still continue to stumble to this day. So, you know, again, as friends of ours say, we're all learning a new language right now. And, you know, we all don't have the words to be able to adequately describe what we're feeling at times and, and you know, adequately try and be a true ally um you know and we're, we're making it up as we go we're making a ton of mistakes i think what we're trying to do as a brand though is to make our mistakes publicly and to try and show up as leaders and say we do not know what we're doing here and we don't have all the answers but we're trying and you know hopefully we can all learn this together um again it was kind of weird how it all happened that the helicopters were going above circling above our house as I was birthing this baby so I was in the newborn you know phase while I was trying to figure out what our response was going to be I was trying to figure out what impact we could have I was trying to figure out how to best use our voice I was trying to um, you know we we're coming up against people who were definitely um, not supportive on social media so you know we, we tried to go out with a few different things um, to say you know we stand in solidarity and we don't have the answers but we're we're committed as a leadership team to making an impact in this space and we're committed to doing better and we're committed to doing it publicly and if that means you know putting ourselves out here and you know getting sort of punched for it that's fine like I'm always going to be that person who's happy to take that you know I'm happy to take the hit so um you know I, I think what ha had to happen for a while I had to really go within I, mean, I remember this one afternoon you know I did what most other white people did you know as soon as this happened started really not most but you know certainly a lot of my friends and in my community a lot of people started to really delve into further education and trying to grapple with you know how we could show up so I did all the things you know I, I read I had read a couple of books but I reread a couple and um, bought a few more and then you know made sure that my social media feed was really completely populated with people of color just so I could again hear a different voice and and you know really try to understand from a non-white point of view. Um, I also, it was funny, I, one afternoon I, I had registered for this masterclass on having um, racial conversations and how you could be a leader there. And I was trying to, I was lying on the sofa with, you know, breastfeeding this three-day-old baby with trying to do this webinar <laughs> you know, with, with all these people. They want to be turned on my camera. I'm like, but, but 
like my, my boobies out and I'm, you know, I'm crying and it's all just too much and I've had no sleep. And so I'm, I, you know, I was in the work, like I was trying to immerse myself in the work, you know, and I was, I was in it. So that was kind of happening at the same time that I knew we were feeling pressure to come out with a statement and everything. But I, I, sometimes I take a long time to digest things and sometimes I take a long time to gather my thoughts and, you know, I, I never want to do something just to appear like, Oh, we took the box. We said it. We took, you know, if, if I don't, if I can't articulate it, like from here, then, I don't, I don't want to do it, right? So we, we certainly came out and, and said a few things, but, um, you know, we, we got into action as a leadership group and, you know, it started to talk about what, what else we had to do and what else we, we should be doing. And that was a bit of a, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a healing journey, but, you know, it was certainly, um, it's difficult because we, we felt we were on the path in some ways, you know, sadness uh, privy to, you know, some of the work that we had started to do, but we certainly weren't doing enough and we certainly could have been doing much more and we certainly could have been doing it with a lot more urgency. So we got together with our leadership team and started drawing some, um, you know, really lines in the sand and, and what that looked like was putting together a diversity inclusion statement. So, um, you know, between myself and our Australian CEO and our brand and community director, we came up with a statement you know, it only had like four or five parts to it, but they're rules that will, you know, be part of our narrative for the rest of our life, you know, in the business chick's life. So, you know, little things, well, not little, they're, they're big things of making sure that absolutely minimum 25% of our speakers and panelists and people who are being featured in our magazines and on our masterclasses must be non-white. You know, we must put X amount of dollars toward diversity training every single year. We, you know, we, we went, Sada knows this, we went ahead and went to members of our community who we had been having conversations with over the years informally, you know, um, Sardner had come to us over the years and said, you know, there's, there's not enough diversity at your conferences, you know, and we, we took that on board, you know, beautiful Dixie um, had had similar feedback when she comes to events with four, four or 5,000 women, you know, she wanted to see more women of color. She didn't want to look out and see just a sea of white, which of course we don't want to see either, but you know, really getting into those conversations about how do we tangibly impact those things. So we did that. We put together, like I said, diversity and inclusion committee of um, five of our members who'd been part of that journey um, and started those conversations there. And look, a number of other other tactics and strategies that we tried to get off the ground quite quickly, you know, and got criticised, got criticised quite widely as being performative and too little too late and, and again that that's cool that's cool because I'd rather be doing something than being completely inert and being stuck and just relying on saying we don't know how to do this you know we're going to do it publicly we're going to do it with mistakes we're going to say the wrong things but we just need to be trying and and learning in the trying so that was really our yeah our, our first response when mm-hmm. it all came out and I hear that you've got an advisory board, correct? And I know that Sadna does sit on it. Um, can you tell us about how that board functions to support you in your decision making and how does it work? Yeah, so when we started, we reached out to um, you know, five members in our community that we really respected and thought could be you know, really useful confidants and advisors on this journey. We originally thought that we'd meet quarterly. Um, you know, after the first meeting, it became apparent we have to meet a lot more you know, regularly, more regularly than, than quarterly. And, you know, like, like with anything, we're still, we're still finding our feet there. It's very, very early days. Um, we've used a number of the board members to help when we're putting out statements or articles. You know, there's been a couple of times when I've uh, spoken to the community and reached out to either Fudzi or Kenny and said, can I just can you run your eyes over this? You know, we wrote an article in Latte just recently and we asked a couple, a couple of the board members, please, like, you know, are we rowing the conversation here? Are we, are we, you know, is that pretty, just, just questions, you know, like, are we on the right track with this? And and so that's been really, really useful. So we see them as people who we can rely upon and, and just talk to, you know, to make sure that we're not just coming from one vantage point, point and we're trying to be more representative. So, you know, again, it's very, very, very early days. Um, we're a couple of meetings into it and we don't know how it's going to pan out, but it's just, you know, starting there and saying we have a commitment to be more representative and we want to mirror our community and we want to make sure that all voices are being heard you know that that manifests in ways like we make sure we do social media takeovers regularly we've looked at our purchasing processes internally to make sure that we're supporting um, people of color businesses we've uh, invested in it hasn't happened yet we've, we've invested in some racial training for our own employees so you know we're, we're, we're trying to look at every conceivable part of you know what we um 
our business activities and you know, how we can make an impact. And I know that um, like I've been doing a lot of your online modules and you've had some amazing, fabulous speakers and you've stuck to your, you know, the 25% being people from diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested in finding out is, is there a drop off in attendance when you have people from diverse backgrounds versus when you have non-diverse background speakers? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Again, it's tricky, right? Because it's so different here to Australia and my personal experience has been there has been far more apathy from our Australian audience than our American mm. audience. So I wouldn't say when we have a, a, a non-white person speaking, there's sorry, a drop off, but, I'm, but when we try and do diversity training or have racial conversations, there is definitely a drop off. Um, I think the level of racial education in Australia is very much behind the United States and and we're completely in our infancy when it comes to Mm. having these discussions and it's it's a source of shame for me it's a source of despair at times because you know it's people have just such a basic and rudimentary understanding and they kind of think you know I'm a nice person and I've I'm you know I've got an Indian friend therefore I'm, I'm not a racist and it's it's been really disheartening for us um to see that because we want to be able to get people excited about this work and to get them understanding that it's it's our own humanity and actually we benefit from having these conversations and and our families benefit from having these conversations you know it's not about you know it's 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 not a philanthropic you know endeavor in any way it's it's this is humanity like our liberation (laughs) depends on the liberation of everyone so it's it has been, it's a great question. It has been really, it's been a bitter pill to swallow in seeing that apathy and, you know, in some of the mistakes we've made on social media, you know, people, so that we make a mistake and then people rush to our defense. Oh no, you're, you're, you're amazing. Don't let it, know. it's like, we're not talking about if we're amazing people. Like we're talking about, this is a conversation that has to have. It's a conversation that we all need to be part of. And, you know, you can't exclude yourself from that conversation. Like you can't just write yourself off as a nice person because you've done X, Y, and Z. This is something that we all have to come to the table and debate and learn and educate ourselves. It's actually on white people to do their own education. It's actually on white people to move forward. You know, it's, it's, it's been a really, um, it's been, you know, a, a sad, a sad part of the work. Mm-hmm you know, and definitely a different experience to hear where people I feel are committed to to moving forward and, and um, taking responsibility for their own education. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's so true. And, and, you know, here I think a lot of Australians are so misguided by what's written in the public arena. You know, mm-hmm. n- not so long ago we had that ridiculous cartoon that sent most of us <laughs> who were from a culturally diverse background completely wild. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, two days ago, we had a, a very, and I'm not even going to mention that person's name, but a very well-known reporter actually writing an article in the paper saying, you know, Melbourne's issue of the second wave was because of the migrant community. So, so wholly laying the blame of the second wave onto a group of people. And the problem we had, and, and, you know, there's a whole range of reporters and politicians who do that on a regular basis. And mm. I think, like you said, it's up to us as the community to mm. actually work through what is real and what isn't real in this arena. Mm. And, and this is where, you know, I sitting even on, on your diversity board, it's really interesting because Business Chicks has the opportunity to reframe these conversations Mm. But to reframe them, you have to get engagement from the whole or most of your community to reframe that. Mm. And, you know, there, therein lies the challenge. And I'm interested in, in talking about how do, we, how do we get to the point where you have a person of colour on your main stage speaking mm. and your room is filled with the community that you represent no matter where you are. I mean, that, that's an amazing thing to, to go for. But how do we, I don't have the answers, but that's kind of what we've got to aim for, isn't it? A hundred percent. But then there's next step to that. So that's, that, we can do that. That's it. We've done that before. So we've had amazing speakers like the, Dr. Terrorai Trent and Somali Ma'am and Azura Antoinette and Kemi Nekvapil. And we've, look, don't worry, we've got filled yeah. rooms, right? So, so we can do that. We know we can do that because these women are freaking amazing and deserve a full house at a, at a main stage. That's easy. The next thing you want to do, though, is make sure that you're 
you know, your audience is diverse. There's again, there's no need, there's no use in having these amazing talented women if it's just a complete whitewash of, of, of people, right? I mean, it's, it's one thing, but we want to make sure the audience is diverse and representative of the community as well. The, the thing, I mean, what's happened with COVID, right, is obviously we've had to pivot all our delivery onto digital and it means that we can't sort of capture people in an audience and, you know, they're captive, right? Like you paid your... to go to one of our conferences. You've got to sit there. You've got to listen. Like no one's going to get up and and leave the room, right? It does get more challenging when you're, um, you know, you've got to opt into a webinar and you've got to, you know, sign up for that one topic, right? So we get that's a challenge. And, you know, you you made a point, you know, how do we get past the apathy? How do we get the whole community engaged? And, you know, I I mean, I don't have the answers exactly like you, Sadna. I I don't have the answers, but all I know is it's our commitment to keep on going, right? Not to kind of just go, oh, well, we put on that webinar and it didn't work and therefore see you later, we tried. You know, that that's not leadership. Like that is not leadership and it's a commitment. We had that discussion in one of our board meetings to say, you know, we've just got to keep going. We've got to find ways to reframe. You know, we've got to pretty much... um, almost handpick some some community leaders to you know so they can get in their little subset of society and bring those people along we've just got to find whoever those leaders are and bring them along for the journey so you know I suppose I just say that to to know that it's going to be a long 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 game and it's my absolute hope that when you know the media dies down and and this moment in time passes which you know a lot of it already has in 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 the main mainstream media we've just got to keep going you know we've got to make sure it's a conversation I think you know it's challenging right now and we can't meet up in person you know if if we didn't have the pandemic I could assure you I'd be having round table after round table after round table after round table begging people to come into the offices and sit and let's let's whiteboard this out and let's come up with some solutions and let's show you what we've done and what have you done and, and we just you know we can't bring people together and that's our magic right we, we love we, we love a hug and we love to be able to bounce off of one another but you know it's 